webinar on valuing water. Uh, today we will be discussing mapping climate-related risks and opportunities to organizational business functions, a framework that we have developed in partnership with several um, entities, including Denver Water, San Francisco Public Utility uh, Commission, the Water Research Foundation, the Water Utility Climate Alliance, otherwise known as WUCA, and the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies. Um, before we start, I have a few uh, different housekeeping items for you all. Uh, today's presentation is currently available in the handouts box in the GoToWebinar platform, and you can access them at any time. Um, in addition, we have held time for questions at the end of our webinar. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to write them in the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel um, during our presentation, and we will address them during our Q&A portion of the webinar. Next slide. My name is Emily Wasley. Uh, I am with WSP and I lead WSP USA's Corporate Climate Risk Adaptation and Resilience Practice. Um, I support publicly traded, privately held companies and various utilities to understand, assess and address climate change on a variety of different scales. Um, I'm joined by my two esteemed colleagues, Kimberly Grubert and Alua Salaminova, uh, who are both project consultants on our team of WSP and also working at the intersection of climate risk and resilience. Without these two, um, this project would not have been possible. So I want to give them um, both a huge thanks and uh, gratitude for their work. Um, my colleagues and I will be presenting an innovative approach and framework that we co-developed with US-based water utilities to help them map climate-related risks and opportunities to their critical business functions. We will provide a quick overview of the key drivers um, that led to the development of this framework, a little overview of the project itself, um, we'll walk you through the framework, and then we'll provide you some concrete um, insights on the two water utility um, um, businesses that we worked with to test this framework out. Uh, then we'll provide some key insights and open it up to questions. Um, here's a quick spoiler alert. Um, some of the key insights is that throughout the development of this framework, we found that this approach um, could really be applied to any organization regardless of location, regardless of size, um, and any organization really interested in exploring climate-related risks and opportunities across their enterprise. Next slide. So some of the key drivers that led to this work um, is the fact that climate change is here. It's now, it's already impacting water utilities. Water utilities are preparing for climate change, um, and climate change is going to exacerbate um, existing and future uh, underlying conditions and vulnerabilities that your water utilities face. Um, we know that there are two main approaches to addressing climate change, both uh, reducing your greenhouse gas emissions, also preparing for the physical impacts of climate change. This framework and this project primarily focused on the physical impacts of climate change, although we were looking at co-benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions while also preparing for climate change in the future. Water utilities are really taking an all hazards approach because they have to. So this um, graphic on the top, on the bottom right really illustrates the variety of different stresses and chronic stresses that water utilities face today and will continue to face over time, whether it's population growth, uh, migration of people to new cities, um, different competition for water resources, diminishing water resources, anything related to um, shocks and stresses such as cyber attacks um, on water utilities, it faces the gamut in terms of a variety of different hazards that water utilities face. And um, really looking at um, the business functions that operate the water utilities requires an all hazards approach. Um, and traditionally, business functions within an organization um, that don't traditionally think about climate change on a day-to-day -day basis, such as HR, human resources, um, finance, um, engineering, perhaps it's um, operations or, you know, it's those business functions that really don't normally think about um, future climate change, they're addressing the impacts from today. Um, this is a framework that helps them do that. Um, water utilities really want to also begin mainstreaming climate considerations and other systemic risks into their business functions and the way that they do business and the way that they operate their utilities, they operate their organization um, to really proactively prepare for what's next. So these were some key drivers uh, that led us to this project with several water utilities. Next slide. 
So the project really had three main goals. One was to pilot test a framework that we had developed um, years before. Um, and this is a year long project, um, but a, a kind of basic framework that we had developed in, um, in collaboration with a couple of different water utilities. Uh, we really wanted to test it out in real time and we needed a creative way to, to do that. So um, by testing it out, we were also wanting to enhance the framework. So make it flexible, tailorable, adaptable um, to utilities to really help them uh, focus their assessment on climate related risks, look at various different opportunities or solutions um, and ask those key climate questions um, that you know, they may be too afraid to ask or they may not know to ask. Um, and they have that discussion collaboratively and across the utility. Um, our third goal was really to begin the mainstreaming process, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, really looking at how, how water utilities can accelerate the integration of climate considerations into their decision making. So when they invest in infrastructure, when they make retro um, updates or retrofits to their infrastructure, when they're hiring new staff, how can they make those decisions based on a future climate that they're going to face? Um, our project also had uh, several different objectives. One was we looked across the full gamut of um, existing frameworks, um, some of which we got questions about today, which we will address, um, to really see where other frameworks um, were, were touching upon items that we didn't already have in our framework that we could add, that would be a value add to water utilities and the challenges that water utilities face internally. We then pilot tested the framework with two water utilities, which my colleagues will speak about. One was with Denver Water, in Colorado, and the other was with the San Francisco Public Utility Commission in California. We are in the process of expanding and updating the framework and an associated guidebook so it can help folks um, understand how to use the framework effectively. And then um, we also wanted to make sure that communication and outreach materials were available to those users of the guidebook and the framework. Next slide. So um, the innovative approach that we took really um, comes to this forefront of tabletop exercises. And this is a picture of a traditional tabletop exercise. Um, you gather around a table, you have uh, future scenario narratives, you work together um, in person to really collaborate, discuss really hard systemic topics um, to, that are impacting you today and may impact you tomorrow. A lot of this approach um, stems from the Department of Defense, um, some military, uh, war gaming exercises, and also the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, um, who traditionally runs tabletop exercises as a way to um, understand how, how communities and um, entities will respond and prepare for um, different shocks to a system and to a city. Um, so this is what a traditional tabletop exercise looks like. Um, Kim, if you can go to the next um, graphic. Because of COVID, this is what our tabletop exercise looked like. So um, it was not in person, but it, sh it proved to be incredibly valuable because um, every participant was engaged. We had leadership from the top who um, opened up the tabletop exercise, welcoming folks, um, expressing their desire and their interest in this topic and this effort, um, and really looking at um, different ways to exchange ideas and to discuss really systemic and complex issues that we're facing around climate change. So we were able to crack the code on tabletop exercises where we were able to think about uh, what's happening now to the water utilities in a, in a changing climate. Um, we were able to go through this process on the right, which is the exercise cycle. So design and develop the scenario that we wanted to play out th through the exercise. We conducted the exercise, we evaluated it with feedback from the participants, and then that led to some significant actions that they're taking on right now to implement and start to mainstream climate considerations into um, their business. Next slide. So this is the framework, um, and it's broken up kind of in two different sections. One section has the first three steps, and that's those are the steps that you take before you conduct a tabletop exercise. So um, step one is really defining the assessment objectives and initiate the planning. So this is where you, uh, you develop the business case. So you're able to articulate the value of investing in this assessment. You 
relay that to leadership, you get leadership buy-in, you identify a actual um, assessment leader. So you have a point of contact who will be leading this effort throughout the whole process. Um, and then with that, you develop your, your scope of work, your timeline and budget. The next step is really to determine the focus for your assessment. So which business functions do you wanna focus on? Um, we selected three because of our time constraints and budget constraints, but that we felt was a good uh, starting point to, to select three business functions to focus on. You build a team across the, the three business functions of representatives, and then you start beginning to collect existing resources to understand what your baseline and foundational knowledge is. Step three is really when we get into um, designing and preparing for the tabletop exercise. So you'll, you'll notice that some of the text is in blue, some of it is in gray. So the way to read this graphic is that if you're a smaller organization or a smaller utility, um, you may not have the resources or the time to conduct a tabletop exercise. So instead you could conduct a workshop or you could go through a lighter version of this framework, which is the steps that are in gray. Um, the more advanced steps are those in blue. So step three is a more advanced step because it includes the tabletop exercise. So through step three, you develop the tabletop exercise scenario narrative, you prepare participants by conducting a climate change 101 training, and then you develop the tabletop exercise materials. So that is what you do before the tabletop exercise actually convenes. Then during the tabletop exercise, you have three other steps, um, which includes conducting in, uh, the tabletop exercise to really map those potential impacts of climate stressors and cascading effects. So you're looking at those underlying conditions that water utilities or organizations face right now, um, such as aging populations, such as um, lack of existing resources or, or lack of affordable housing. And you look at these underlying stresses that could really be um, causing uh, some, some issues already for a water utility or an organization. And climate change on top of that will just exacerbate the conditions and lead to some cascading impacts. So that's step four. So five, five is starting to really understand what your risk tolerance is, understand and define and prioritize what those risks are um, and map them to the business functions. While this process is happening, you'll also identify some gaps in data and information that you need to really inform decisions as you go forward. Step six is the final step, and that's really looking at the opportunities and solutions across the business functions. So this is where we look at co-benefits of both greenhouse gas and, um, mitigation measures, um, climate adaptation measures, but also measures that can help to improve safety and health of employees, to improve um, working conditions of outdoor workers, to um, look at effective and efficient economic measures for investment. So, those are really, those are the solutions that we want to identify. Uh, we look at them from the short and the long term so that we can really manage the risks now and into the future and maximize sustainability and resilience opportunities. Um, we, we work through with uh, developing recommendations for implementing those solutions and then um, working with leadership to present those, those implementation and next steps um, so that you can get buy-in and further um, investment and funding and um, and really a uh, championship from the leadership team. Um, this is an iterative process. It's a continually improvement process. Um, so this last step, step 6E, really looks at reevaluating assessment findings, objectives, and assessing additional business functions. So you can monitor and regularly report progress. So again, this is a framework. It might look very busy. Um, it's easier than it looks. Um, and it takes, it took us about a year to go through each, to, to go through this whole process. So if that helps to give you a little time frame. Um, and these were the partners, as I mentioned at the beginning, that really were instrumental uh, to making this a reality. Next slide. I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kim, who's going to um, introduce the Denver Water um, tabletop exercise that we hosted. Awesome, thank you, Emily. Um, so before we uh, jump into how to actually apply this framework um, and how we applied it to Denver Water, we first just wanted to give a little bit of context. Um, so Denver Water is the largest and oldest water utility in Colorado, and it serves about 1.3 million customers, which is about a quarter of all of Coloradans. Um, and it's been in operation since 1918. So Colorado, as you can see in the, the map on the bottom right, um, the pin is showing approximately where Denver is located. And then the map on the top right 
um, you can see a dot of Colorado or of uh, Denver area, and you'll notice that it is on the eastern side of the front range of the Rocky Mountains. So it's located essentially in the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains, meaning that this area is already pretty dry and arid. Um, and has a lot of days of sunshine. Um, in fact, there's about 300 days of sunshine a year. So between this sunny disposition and some robust recreation and job opportunities, the population in this area has been rapidly expanding. Um, and in fact, it's on track to double by 2050, reaching over 8 million people. So with climate change, most experts agree that warming will occur in Denver and in the mountain watersheds to the west. And we're already seeing that the quantity of snowpack has been lessening and peak runoff has occurred earlier and earlier over the last 20 years. And temperatures have already increased about two degrees Fahrenheit or 1.1 degrees Celsius. And they're projected to increase another four degrees Fahrenheit or 2.2 degrees Celsius by 2050. So as Emily said, and as that last slide suggested, it's clear that climate change is already impacting water utilities and these changes are gonna to continue to exacerbate the existing and future underlying conditions and vulnerabilities that they're experiencing. So to tackle this question and this challenge, we started with step one of the framework, um, which was to build the case for Denver Water to do this type of climate risks and opportunities assessment and to define the goals and objectives, which you'll see listed on the top. We kicked off the project in November of 2019 and established exercise planning teams in early 2020. And Denver Water's exercise planning team included four different business functions that represent Denver Water's three different systems, which were the natural system that includes watersheds and forest management teams, the built system that includes staff and for the infrastructure for water treatment and distribution, and the business system, which includes staff from finance and risk management. So throughout the first half of 2020, we progressed through steps two through three of the framework and continued to refine the objectives and started planning for the climate tabletop exercise. And step three includes developing a playbook, which you'll see in the image on the right. And this playbook gives information about the different business functions and the different climate scenarios that the participants are gonna focus on during the tabletop exercise. We then moved into steps four, five, and six, which are conduct, which we're actually conducting the tabletop exercise. And our exercise with Denver Water contained four modules during which we explored three different climate scenarios. So this first scenario um, really looked back at the last 20 years during which I said Denver Water has already warmed and it's already seeing different hydro hydrological changes, species shifts and some wildfire changes. We then looked at what Denver would be like if it was four degrees Fahrenheit or 2.2 degrees Celsius warmer, which is on track with the future climate projections for this area. And then we warmed it up even more to seven degrees Fahrenheit and imagined a future with multiple simultaneous wildfires occurring following years of chronic drought. And what would that look like for Denver water and what type of systems do they have in place or could they get in place to help them address that scenario? And that's really what we focused on in the fourth module, which was entirely focused on identifying solutions to address and manage all of the risks that we thought. And what we did was we looked at what types of plans, policies, and procedures Denver Water already has in place now or could get in place now to handle these types of future situations. And we ended up identifying over 70 different solutions. And just finally, one of the key aha moments was an expression of gratitude by the participants for being given the chance to all come together as a group of 40 people to share their knowledge and questions and concerns with each other um, in, a, in a format that they otherwise um, wouldn't have been able to do without this type of collaborative tabletop exercise approach. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alua to tell you about the similar exercise we conducted with San Francisco. Alua, you might want to come off mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Kim. So um, another water utility that took part in this project is the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, or SFUC. It's one of the largest water utilities in California, and uh, it has over 2.7 million customers. 
These are mainly in the city of San Francisco, but also broader in the Bay Area and include some of the largest tech hubs in the Silicon Valley, including cities of Menlo Park and Palo Alto. And SFUC also provides water to some of the largest um, organizations, such as the San Francisco International Airport, NASA Research Center, and Stanford University. In terms of the major water supplies, the FUC provides water from diverse sources, including snowmelt, rainfall, groundwater, and some of this water also comes from the recycled water systems. The image that you see on the right is actually a watershed um, that supplies about 85% of water for SFUC customers, and it runs through the Yosemite National Park. Next slide, please. So to help SFUC to better understand their current and future climate-related risks and opportunities, we engaged multiple stakeholders from this organization and helped them to develop and conduct a tabletop exercise, similarly as Denver Water did, and um, our exercise took place in October and November last year. So the TTX was really a facilitated discussion that also took place 100% virtually over the course of three days. And we engaged about 15 representatives from different business functions that were identified as most critical to SFUC operations. And as you can see, these are business services, health and safety and watershed management. Business services uh, was chosen because it includes finance and budgeting, which is very important for um, capital projects um, of the organization, health and safety, that mainly includes safety and well-being programs for SFPC employees, especially outdoor workers that are already very vulnerable to climate-related impacts, and watershed management includes vegetation and broader ecosystems management in the Bay Area. And so because most of these stakeholders are not involved in climate-related discussions or are not actively working on climate-focused projects as part of their day-to-day -day jobs, we also developed a playbook for them, and you can see the cover on the right, because we really wanted to make sure that we provide as much context around climate change as possible to make sure that everyone is engaged in productive and active discussion and um, the information that people can brainstorm together will be decision useful in the end. So from the methodological standpoint, we first looked at historical climate drivers that have been already observed in the Bay Area and that SFUC operations and employees that have been already influenced by. And then we looked at two future looking scenarios and we consider it two timeframes, 2040, so what the Bay Area may experience in the next 20 years and 2070 by looking at a longer term projection. The scenario that we chose is RCP 8.5 which is um, often called a worst case scenario because it assumes very high future carbon emissions and it does not include any climate policy driven mitigation. We tried to keep the description of these climate projections in a non-technical uh, and a narrative form to make sure that it, this information is accessible and decision useful for all SFEC participants. And so after we introduced these three scenarios, we opened up the discussion and asked SFUC business function representatives to share some of the business function specific, but also utility wide actions around climate mitigation, adaptation and resilience that may be already taking place within the organization or something that they should be actively considering and planning to enhance their organizational preparedness and resilience to future climate change impacts. And so through this foresighting session, SFUC identified uh, multiple current and emerging climate-related risks and opportunities. For example, one of the risks was that SFUC um, realized that they, if they continue building their infrastructure and forecasting models based on historical climate conditions, they may become more exposed to range of other climate drivers that can ultimately cause uh, operational, financial, or reputational risks for them. But at the same time, they realize that some of these changes can also present an opportunity for them because they can start investing more in a better data quality, investing in new technologies to enable power storage or automate some of their data collection and processing, and also try to integrate some of these climate considerations in capital planning and project screening when they select them for funding. So um, overall, the 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so overall, the SFUC identified over 40 different uh, climate solutions and opportunities. And uh, some of these are um, initiatives that can already integrate uh, climate-related considerations into existing plans and procedures, whereas others may mean that they need to launch brand new projects that may require an internal buy-in, um, maybe even hiring dedicated staff and allocation of uh, specific funding. SFPC also found themselves um, in a stronger position to start disclosing some of these climate risks um, and opportunities publicly. They also realized that um, there are a lot of very good climate solutions that could be integrated in some of their health and safety and well-being policies so that they can help their employees to cope better with um, uh, fatigue or any related um, stress as a result of, for example, wildfire smoke or heat stress that some of their uh, workers have been already influenced by. And um, another very important outcome of the tabletop exercise was that the organization decided to start hosting monthly climate coordination meetings that are now open to multiple business functions within the organization because they really want to um, give the momentum and continue this conversation internally. And they're also developing a climate policy that will become uh, public and will be shared on their website later this year. Over to you, Kim. Thanks, Alua. Um, and just to wrap up again on Denver Water. Um, so I mentioned before there were over 70 different solutions that were identified during our TTX. And since July, Denver Water, <clears throat> excuse me, has narrowed those 70 different solutions down to about 25 that they're gonna start pursuing this year. And some of these actions are not all just new projects, but it includes embedding climate change information into work that's already underway. Um, so a good example is they already have a robust main replacement strategy um, but they really wanna make sure that their strategy and program is climate ready. So they're going to be looking through that strategy this year and analyzing their current practices to see how climate risks, such as rising temperatures, are going to impact the work that they're already doing and how they can shift that strategy to adjust. Um, they're also investing in new climate research and um, they're going to be expanding the tabletop exercise approach. Um, in fact, the watershed planning team is going to be doing another tabletop exercise this year with the state and national forest service to talk through what the warmer climate scenarios may mean for state wildfire preparedness and response and recovery efforts. And then finally, um, as noted in step three of the framework, um, Denver Water and uh, SFPC both conducted climate 101s in preparation for the tabletop exercises. And these presentations basically established a baseline knowledge for all of the exercise participants. And um, they, the, all the participants found them incredibly valuable just to have that, that background understanding of um, current climate conditions and what to expect in the future before entering this exercise. Um, so they're going to continue that type of education across the enterprise, um, and they're considering um, doing some short videos with the business functions that participated so that other Denver Water staff can see the benefit of this work. So as all of these outcomes imply, both Denver Water and San Francisco Public Utilities Commission are actively working to embed and mainstream climate change considerations into their activities. And it's been incredibly exciting and rewarding to help these major water utilities embed future ready concepts into their practices and decision making. And we're excited to see where they take this work next. And now I'm going to hand it back to Emily to wrap us up. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Alua. So we are at time. Um, so I'm going to go quickly through some key insights. Um, and Sharon, um, hopefully we have some time for questions. But, um, you know, this was really groundbreaking. Um, project. It really focused on future actions that uh, organizations can take, water utilities can take now to address future climate changes. Um, all the participants were incredibly engaged throughout the project, and um, the project actually won a 2020 Environmental Business Journal Award uh, last year for all of this effort. Um, some key challenges were that, you know, traditionally organizations look at historical climate context and haven't yet incorporated future climate projections into their decision making. Um, there are, you know, with tabletop exercises I mentioned before, we really um, were able to systematically address chronic systemic issues to climate change through the exercise process versus what, um, you know, traditionally 
is used for a tabletop exercise, which is response recovery. Um, some of the planning horizons were a little challenging. Um, looking at 2070 was a little too far out. So we learned a lot from uh, which planning horizons really work well and uh, which scenarios, how many scenarios to use, et cetera. Uh, the key innovations were um, here on the right is the uh, task force and climate related financial disclosures for core elements. Uh, the TCFD is a framework that's used by financial institutions and other privately held organizations and publicly traded organizations. Um, we leverage TCFD to weave through the framework, so it is TCFD aligned. Um, the framework was also a really uh, significant co-development process. So without the support from the Wadi Utilities, this would not have been possible. Um, and lastly, this framework is applicable to any organization. As I mentioned at the beginning, any organization interested in exploring climate-related risks and opportunities now and into the future. And with that, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, there are several upcoming webinars this week and next that we welcome you to join us on. Um, they are focusing again on the valuing water um, to celebrate World Water Day. Um, and please join us for these upcoming um, exciting webinars taking place this week and next week. Next slide. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions or comments about today's presentation or the work that we presented, uh, feel free to reach out. And it's time I'm going to pass it over to Sharon. Thank you, thank you, Emily. Um, so we just dive to a few questions that we received um, from people who registered as well as from the live session. Let's start with the first one. Aside from the site assessment for manufacturing distribution and supply chain, what are the other uh, scenarios such as info uh, is important for decision making? Thanks, Sharon. So this is a great question and a lot of information um, um, that is needed and tabletop exercises and scenario approach taken um, can help organizations and people who don't traditionally think about climate change really start to um, connect the dots between the science of climate change, what they're facing now, the impacts they might be facing and, and experiencing, and what they may face in the future. So um, scenarios are can be used on a variety of different time horizons, can be used across um, a variety of different topics. You can have multiple um, systemic issues. You can throw in some shocks to the systems and really play those out. Um, so it goes beyond just looking at massive infrastructure and supply chains, asset management, into really educating people on what climate change means for them and what they can do now um, collectively as an organization, but also individually as a business function and as a as an employee of the organization, what they can do um, to make sure that future scenario that could be hotter or uh, wetter really doesn't come to fruition. And that includes both uh, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and preparing for the impacts that we're already facing and will face into the future. Thank you. Uh, next question. In the past few years, what action has SFPUC take to reduce their carbon footprint? Great. So I believe they've taken some significant steps, but I will turn it over to Alua to describe a little more detail. Yeah, sure. So the SFPUC actually is a certified with a gold uh, status by the Climate Registry because they've been monitoring and measuring their uh, carbon emissions already for uh, many years. And they also source 100% renewable energy. It mainly comes from the hydropower system, from the HHG power system, but also they now diversifying their renewable energy portfolio and they also offer a program that customers can uh, basically receive California certified renewable energy um, through the pg and &E, uh, partnership. And it comes from solar, wind and uh, biomass. And biomass energy is actually generated um, in SFPC wastewater treatment plants that convert biogas into heat and power. So they were doing a lot around climate mitigation. Thank you. Uh, next question. Does desalination form part of San Francisco water uh, sources? Is it considered part of a potential mitigating mitigation scenario? So We're speaking about desalination. Yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. So, um, and I'll turn it over to Alua also, but um, so this uh, tabletop exercise and, and project really focused, as I mentioned, on the physical impacts of climate change. So preparing for uh, extreme weather events and the chronic changes in the in the climate, like sea level rise, um, higher temperatures, precipitation patterns, etc. Um, but in our solutions discussions, we were talking about um, co-benefits of adaptation solutions that also 
were uh, could be used as greenhouse gas mitigation solutions. Alua, do you want to? Yeah. So um, SFPC actually does not um, have a desalination plant at the moment, and so their water really comes from uh, the three key watersheds in the Bay Area. And as I said, they also actively leveraging um, using recycled and reclaimed water. And in general, building a desalination plant is a very expensive effort and perhaps it's something they will be exploring. I know that in San Diego, something that uh, they're already researching. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see uh, what will be their future um, uh, research efforts on, on that front. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, the last question. Can you provide real world examples of best practice that is relation to carbon free foot, sorry, carbon footprint reduction and comparison to status quo? So I think um, I might pass on that question because uh, our, our project was really much more focused on the physical impacts of climate change, not the carbon reduction efforts. Um, but I think the examples that uh, Lua just provided um, and some that Denver Water is also investing in um, can serve as real world examples. Kim, do you want to give a couple of examples of Denver Waters GHG mitigation efforts? Yep. Um, and apologies, I moved to the wrong slide, or I moved to the next slide. Um, yes, so Denver Water actually just in 2019, they just finished um, their new administration building. And this administration building um, was designed to meet both lead platinum and net zero energy standards. So essentially, the building is um, producing all of its own energy from an array of solar panels on the rooftop and over the parking lots and garages. Um, and the building is also using a number of um, uh, energy efficiency best practices, including radiant heating and cooling and energy efficient LED light fixtures. And it is also um, similar to SFPC, it's also using um, rainwater capture for irrigation and on-site water treatment and recycling um, that they're reusing in the building and throughout the site for um, irrigation. And actually the designs of these water reuse systems is a first in Colorado. Um, so Denver Water is actively working to expand state regulations so that they can clear the way for other types of developments like this in the state. Thank you. So it looks like we're at the end of our webinar session. Uh, please feel free to follow up directly with Emily via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining today. And a big thank you, uh, Kim, Alua, and uh, Emily for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. I will wrap up the webinar now. Thank you.